Yeah, I think we can go ahead. I know the uh, the link just went live a minute ago, but it looks like we had a good chunk of people here. Um, perfect. All right, let me just get my screen share up and we can get going. All right, perfect. We can go ahead and um, get started. Um, let me just first introduce myself. First of all, I, I appreciate everybody joining in. We got a great group of folks here already, but for anybody who hasn't met me, uh, my name is Mike Bohansky. I'm the Region 1 Medical Director. Uh, we have run now three of these sessions. This is our fourth one, um, and this is put together by Maine EMS and the Medical Directors and Practice Board um, to highlight all the information we know and have available to us on the vaccine. And um, we've done this as a town hall style so that we can try to get you as much information as we know, show you the science that we have available to us, but primarily leave this as an opportunity to try and answer any questions. Um, Matt and I are gonna be kind of co-hosting this. So Matt, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I echo Mike's thanks uh, to everyone who's showing up today. This is a great turnout. We really appreciate it. Uh, hello to everyone on Zoom, on the phone, and on Facebook Live. My name is Matthew Scholl, and I'm the Main EMS Medical Director. Awesome. And with my shared screen on, my participant list is relatively hidden, um, but I do see uh, some Main EMS staff on um, a couple of other of our MDPB members. I also see uh, Dr. Schmidt from uh, Region 1 here uh, and our um, uh, Southern Maine partner. And so thank you all for coming, we appreciate it. Um, all right. Um, so goal of today is, um, again, to try and do this town hall style, answer any questions you have, give as much information as we possibly can. A couple of ways we're going to do that. First of all, um, we know that EMS clinicians are going to be in this first group offered the COVID-19 vac uh, COVID vaccine along with other healthcare workers in the state. Um, and that's where our impetus for this is the main EMS and MDPB prepared this presentation to try and come up with the best evidence we have surrounding the vaccine and um, give that evidence to you because ultimately this is your decision whether or not you're going to get vaccinated against COVID. We recognize that there's uncertainty around, it, around this vaccine. We wanna recognize that this has been perhaps the most stressful time in your career and in many of our lives. Um, and the added strain of considering this vaccine, its safety, its efficacy can be really daunting. Undoubtedly, you've heard about it, um, but our goals today are to provide you with the best possible evidence surrounding the vaccine in the hope that this empowers you to make a meaningful decision. I'm sure at this point, everybody has had plenty of experience with Zoom, but just a little background on how we're going to try and do this today. Um, the chat function is probably the easiest to pose questions, but certainly you can use the raise hand function as well. I'll pause a bunch of times along the way to, uh, to give people a chance to ask questions. Um, and Matt's going to be monitoring that chat function. And then uh, the main EMS staff is actually simultaneously live streaming this on Facebook. So we may get some questions fed to us from there and we'll, uh, we'll tackle those as they come. So big picture, we want to provide everything we know about the safety and the efficacy um, to help you compare the risks and benefits so that each of you can make a meaningful decision about vaccination. Along the way, we're gonna provide data that's available to us, be as open and honest as possible. I recently heard a pediatrician who was talking on NPR and has vaccine conversations all the time, talk about how her approach with, uh, with parents is brutal transparency. And that was kind of the mantra that we used when putting this together of let's give you everything we know and let you make the decisions for yourself. Um, certainly the slides are going to act as kind of our, our first part of the presentation, but the, the big goal here is to prompt questions, ask questions, answer questions. At the beginning here, we're going to talk a little bit about how vaccination works, how the immune system works, specifically about how these, these two types of vaccines, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna ones, um, work. Um, and then we're going to get into a lot more of the frequently asked questions. We've built this based on a lot of conversations with you, conversations with the providers in our lives um, to, uh, to try and build on the things that seem to be most commonly asked. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll go through that. 
Certainly the deadly impact of this disease can't be overstated. We've seen over 300,000 American deaths, which is more Americans than died in World War II. And the current daily death toll is somewhere between a Pearl Harbor attack and a September 11th every single day. The disease is spread across the country with no area spared and some locations in crisis with hospitals overwhelmed, staff shortages. Um, and Maine has seen a particularly in, uh, tremendous increase just over the past month. Um, in the last weeks, we've seen an unprecedented increase in cases. You all know this, you feel this in your day-to-day -day clinical. Um, we were putting this talk together. I found this artist who had demonstrated this, uh, this kind of street art painted on the side of a building somewhere. Um, and it just was the best graphical representation I've seen so far that says 2020 has been a hard year. We all know that the, and feel the weight of COVID every day. We know that this has impacted every aspect of our lives, professionally, personally, and somehow everything right now just seems to be a bit different due to COVID. Up until now, our primary response has been defensive or protective, using our strategies of PPE, distancing, et cetera. But for the first time, we see an offensive move to combat this and turn the tide. Uh, and among the sacrifice, illness, and isolation, this is kind of the first piece of hope. And as uh, was these, these images here kind of really drew that to me. So I want to jump a little bit into the science. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we develop immunity. And in this photo, starting at the upper left-hand corner, we're going to kind of follow a coronavirus exposure. Um, so this is the molecule that everybody has seen at this point, or the coronavirus uh, that, that is actually a sphere in shape with these spike proteins on the outside, and then the RNA genetic material on the inside. This enters the body, the human body, particularly through utilizing that uh, spike protein as kind of a key to open the lock to our body, and that lock in, in our case is the ACE2 receptor, and that allows that viral cell to enter into our cells. Once it's in our cells, it acts like all other viruses um, in that it uses our cells mechanics to, use, to replicate its genetic material, replicate itself, and produce a whole bunch of copies to then uh, A, make us sick, but then B, make us very contagious. Over on the right hand side of the screen, we see how the body responds to that, or the immune response, which is at some point our body recognizes that something foreign is present and doesn't belong there. It then tries to create two um, different versions of attacks um, through T cells and B cells, which will try to identify this foreign material. It does that by creating antibodies that can stick to that foreign material and then use the immune system to attack and kill anything that has antibodies built to it. The reason we put this up is to say that this, this part where we're creating antibodies and teaching the immune system how to react and find these viral cells quickly is the whole key to how our immune system works and how vaccines work in that we want to prime our immune system, let it see some of this material and already create these antibodies early so that when we uh, encounter a viral um, particle, it can attack and kill it very rapidly. One thing I didn't point out at the be beginning, in all of our slides like this one, you will see QR codes anytime we've got some reference material. Um, use your cell phone little video camera uh, and it will, uh, sorry, your cell phone camera um, to scan over these. It will bring you to the sources uh, in case you're looking for any more material on what we're putting up here. All right, I promise only two more slides on microbiology, but we're gonna dive a little bit into how vaccines in general work and in particular, how the vaccines that we're gonna be talking about today work. So all vaccines take advantage of the same pathway of trying to teach our immune system that there is something foreign out there, get our immune system primed so that the next time it sees it, it can uh, attack it very quickly. There are many ways that vaccines do this, including vaccines you've seen before. The most common vaccines use viral particles themselves, either in a live but weakened state, those are the live attenuated vaccines like we see in the MMR or the chicken pox vaccine, or in an inactivated or killed viral state where you get exposed to things like dead virus, as was example in the polio uh, vaccine. The other really common pathway we see in vaccines we use every day is subunits, which is either taking one of these viral particles and putting it through kind of a metaphorical blender and exposing only to pieces of the um, virus, or by actually creating and forming some of these pieces, some of these proteins artificially, 
and exposing our body to it that way so our body can learn it and create those antibodies and immune response. The newer vaccine technology today that we're going to talk about is primarily the mRNA vaccine. Um, but I'm also just going to quickly mention the viral vector vaccine because these function the same way, which is rather than using whole viruses, whether weakened or killed, or using pieces of viruses, these use a small piece of genetic material that forms these pieces of viruses or the proteins um, and then introduces that genetic material into our body. The reason that's particularly important is that this genetic material by being introduced to our body uses our cells own structures to create the proteins so that our body can identify those really quickly and early. The reason we've heard about these so much recently is the um, actual research and then manufacturing behind creating these small pieces of genetic material is much faster than we get with any of the versions of live attenuated, inactivated, or subunits of viruses. So the reason that the first ones that we've seen go through the emergency use authorization and now um, manufacturing and dispensing are these mRNA vaccines is because of the speed with which this technology allows us to do that. Viral vector vaccines use that same type of technology, but they put it into a virus that doesn't make us sick exposes to a virus that doesn't make us sick, but still has that same genetic material and is still gonna use our internal cellular structures to try and create some of these foreign proteins. I've got one more picture to show you what this looks like. And then I promise we're gonna stop with the, uh, the microbio. Um, but the two vaccines that are available today against coronavirus create this immune reaction by introducing this single piece of messenger RNA or mRNA that's enveloped by your cell, which then transiently builds one single viral protein named the spike protein. Visually, what that looks like is this little piece of genetic material that's surrounded by what is called a lipid nanoparticle. Um, this is a little bit of fat encasing that helps to keep that mRNA stable because mRNA on its own is not very stable. It doesn't last very long, but that also helps it to enter into our cells. Once that's entered into the cytoplasm of our cell, ribosomes, a natural structure within our cell, pick up that mRNA and use that mRNA as the code to create a protein and create that spike protein. That spike protein then either gets released from the cell out into the cytoplasm or gets uh, displayed on the cell itself. And this is what um, our immune system identifies as abnormal and starts building that immune reaction too. A couple of things that you'll note here is it never enters into the nucleus. None of this genetic material goes into our own nucleus. It all stays into the cytoplasm of the cell um, or, uh, or released out into the serum. So that um, I specifically bring up because a lot of people ask what the long-term or lasting effects of this technology may be. Um, and we suspect that the answer is none. We know that these mRNA um, uh, molecules have a very short life in our body. Um, they don't stick around very long. It's going to go through this pathway of creating some of these proteins for a day or two, um, and then it is going to be completely gone and again, not change our genetic material or the, the genetic makeup of our cells. Okay, so that brings me to this, which is what is actually in these vaccines. So where there is messenger RNA or the genetic material that's been created to get this spike protein formed, there's that lipid nanoparticle which creates or envelops that uh, mRNA to help it get into our cells. And then some buffers. Um, and those buffers are things that are actually in the liquid helping to stabilize these nanoproteins as well as make sure that they are body compatible. So things like sucrose and potassium products um, that help make sure that our body is able to, uh, to envelop and, and accept these lipid nanoparticles. A couple of things that are not in this, and this will answer some of our FAQs really early. Again, there's no live or attenuated virus. There's no DNA in this or anything that's gonna ever enter our nucleus. There's no preservatives, no human cells, and no animal cells. So that's a lot, and that is kind of the, the important background that we wanted to jump into, into how our body works, how it creates immunity, um, and then specifically the technology of these vaccines, because the fact that this technology is the first time any of us have received an mRNA vaccine has, has brought an awful lot of questions. And so we want to spend a little time going through that cell bio, microbio, um, but we're going to pause there for a minute and, and see what questions we've got about that process or, or what we have so far. 
And Mike, while um, folks are typing in their questions, uh, we've gotten a few other questions that it's a great time to pause and address right now. Thanks to Chief O'Brien who uh, wrote, my code, officer, my code officer, health officer has been receiving calls from citizens to sign up for the vaccinations. They say they have been told to call the local health officer, officer to schedule. I'm not sure this is correct. And as a result, we're looking for direction on what to tell them. I, uh, for folks on Facebook or who are calling in, I wrote back to the chief that at this time, the federal and state CDC is recommending that individuals in what's being called tier 1A be the first to receive the vaccine. So that uh, tier 1A includes healthcare providers on the front lines of the pandemic, as well as uh, individuals living in long-term care facilities and those caring for them in those facilities. And then those are the, pri the first priority of folks who um, are uh, being asked to receive these first vaccines. As we get through the um, vaccine distribution plan, uh, which I have included in the chat for folks who are on uh, Zoom, um, uh, Main EMS will work very closely with services who are vaccine distributors in an effort to alert them when to start prioritizing the other tiers. So tier uh, 1B, tier 2, and tier 3 are the other tiers out there. So um, again, thank you for that question, Chief. And the short answer is that the, uh, the main EMS will be working with folks to alert us all of when the time is to turn our attention to the other tiers. There was a private question that came to me saying, who arranges for EMS individuals to get the vaccine? And uh, the answer to that is uh, we do. Uh, uh, and it's all described in the vaccination plan that I included in the chat, but in brief, Main EMS has been working with service, uh, a select number of services in every county to find services willing to help uh, ensure the vaccination of all EMS clinicians and public safety providers in our first uh, group of individuals and um, uh, the scheduling is going through those services. And it looks like we have one more, um, uh, uh, one more question from Ruth Wall who asks, isn't Pfizer in the first category with Moderna using mRNA? And Ruth, you're exactly right. Both Pfizer and Moderna are, um, their technology is mRNA based, based technology. Pfizer was the uh, organization whose EUA was approved two weeks ago for the UK. And last, or, or, well, I guess it was officially uh, a week ago, Friday, um, it was approved in the FDA. And then Pfizer, excuse me, Moderna's EUA was approved by the FDA this past Friday. Thanks for that question, Ruth. Those are both mRNA vaccines. Oh, and for folks on Zoom uh, who are interested in seeing more information about the buffers, the lipid nano. Uh, particles and the vaccine ingredients themselves. We've put in the FDA's fact sheets for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in the chat function for you. William H asks, my question concerns the risk of antibody dependent enhancement. Um, not certain, William, that I understand what you mean by antibody dependent enhancement. If you wanna give us a little follow-up statement in there, that'd be great. Matt, I can speak to that a little bit. So what, Thanks, Thank you. About, what he's talking about is a phenomena that was seen rarely in a couple vaccines that um, worked in different ways. Uh, I, I believe dengue was one of the classics for this where if you got one strain of it um, and then were exposed to a subsequent strain, your immune system basically got a little derailed and uh, you actually ended up with a worse illness than you would have been expected to have had just having gotten the second strain. So um, that's a, obviously a good question. Um, I think Michael may be pulling up an article here for us. Um, but it's not something that we've seen in this for a couple reasons, because even though we incessantly uh, genotype this particular virus and find subtle variations, we do not have functionally different strains for one thing. Um, and it's something where if that did exist, if we had strains that were different enough to cause this reaction, then we should have seen that in the trials and we have not. So I think it's a, a good theoretical concern. It's actually a question that I got and read up on a little bit because I could not answer it off the top of my head. Um, but that's the best I have right now unless Michael has Googled something uh, better. William, thank you for that question. I, so um, 
the term antibody dependent enhancement is new to me, but the idea of being of the vaccine being able to potentiate illness is not. And both uh, phase three trials looked at this, both Moderna and Pfizer's phase three trials looked at the um, looked at the ability for the vaccine to potentiate even worse disease in the vaccine recipients. And in both cases, they were not able to identify that there's any, any potentiation of the disease after receiving the vaccine. Awesome, thanks for those guys. Uh, turns out you can't click on links while you're screen sharing or it just immediately opens them up. <laughs> um, all right, so keep the questions coming. Um, the next thing I wanted to get into here was the uh, process itself. You know, there are a lot of questions about the process by which these vaccines were developed. We want to take a minute to talk about Operation Warp Speed, how it's facilitated the process. It usually takes several years. And to know that this was deliberately done in the setting of our current public health crisis, which has taken such a toll on the U.S. and, and world population. So I want to pay a little attention um, to this, and I found this diagram from um, the DOD and Operation Warp Speed to kind of be the most helpful uh, to talk about what advantages they were able to um, go after here compared to prior processes and to recognize that they did this without jeopardizing any of the safety steps, but instead by um, uh, parallel processing. And the parallel processing ends up being the really the biggest piece of this that changed the overall timeline. So typical process is highlighted at the top here, which is that phase one and phase two trials, those early um, research and development um, and early clinical trials um, happen one after another, they happen in sequence. And we know that those things got parallel processed very early on here. But the other big thing that happens here is that they wait for all of this stuff to complete before moving on to um, any version of approval that then is has to happen before any manufacturing starts. One of the things that happened with Operation Warp Speed is the federal government provided the funding for the companies that were doing all this research to say, while you were doing the research and while you were doing the clinical trials, we want you, as soon as you got something that looks like it might be promising, start manufacturing it, because we know that, that manufacturing process takes so long. So that by starting that manufacturing process, if the clinical data doesn't work out, we'll dump all that stuff in the trash, but we're still going to pay you for it. That way it allowed these vaccine companies to, uh, to justify running their machines over time, working to create and manufacture as much of this as they possibly could while the clinical trials were still ongoing. To help with this, some of the safety features are that the FDA will go and do um, visits of the sites where manufacturing is occurring. Again, they usually wait till the clinical trials are over then they do their site visit, then they allow manufacturing to start. Rather than doing that, they did their visits very early on and they've done continual visits to the manufacturing site so that manufacturing can continue all throughout here. The phase two and phase three trials happen relatively simultaneously. As soon as the phase two trials started looking promising, they started enrolling folks for the phase three trials and they shortened the overall length of phase three trials. And they did that for two reasons. One is phase three trials typically run two to three years. And they do that to say, how long is this vaccine effective? That's an important question and one we don't have the answer to. But they said, we don't want to wait two to three years to answer that question. If the vaccine is effective today, we want to start using it today. So the participants in those phase two and phase three trials are still enrolled, they're still gathering data, they're still gonna watch them for two to three years. They said, we're not gonna wait for an approval or an emergency use authorization until that uh, data is done. We're gonna start that process sooner. Then they have to answer the question, well, how soon is too soon? And from decades of vaccine experience, we know that Reactions to vaccines themselves happen sometime in the first six weeks. Um, those are your allergic reactions. Those are the types of things where people develop neurologic syndromes or anything like that that happens after a vaccine. They happen in those first six weeks. So all of these trials were designed to say, we have to watch you for at least eight weeks or give some buffer time there for the safety piece. So the safety piece of that initial part would take uh, would last at least eight weeks. Again, further shortening this timeline that usually takes years. So by parallel processing and then shortening in particular that phase three part, we're able to move this through much quicker. Matt, anything you want to add to the slide here? 
No, thank you for that. That's a great explanation. And the, the key parts are that the parallel processing the FDA did was uh, is one of the ways that allowed us to get through this so quickly. Yeah. Awesome. So I know people have a ton of questions about process and hopefully that answered a lot of them, but I want to take this as a chance to, to answer other ones. Dr. Schmitz put a comment in, which I appreciate. Thank you. Um, the phase two in this case uh, still demonstrated the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So phase two in most of these, um, and we're not going to focus a whole lot on phase two data today, but absolutely did that, showed the safety and efficacy. And then for phase three, especially looking at that duration of effect. And so those are the, the phase three participants are the ones that they're going to continue watching for the prolonged period of time. It's also, I think, fair to note, it, to note that um, this, the number of individuals enrolled in phase three was relatively unprecedented. It allowed us to have a tremendous population to learn about the safety profile of this. And the first piece of the phase three trial is uh, learning about the safety profile for those 77,000 people in both of the, tri both of the uh, trials here. And as Mike mentioned, Mike Bohansky mentioned, we're gonna continue following them uh, for a period of time to understand more about the duration of protection from these vaccines. Awesome, any other questions about process, about operation warp speed? Uh, I know Matt and I and several of our colleagues have talked about how we were very glad that this moved quickly and efficiently. I do um, have a little bit of disdain for the name and that it makes it automatically sound like it's too fast. Uh, but I, I, the, um, that slide before and the descriptions of how this process worked really uh, helped for me to answer why it was that so much effort was put behind efficiency, making this process happen without cutting any of the safety steps. All right. Well, folks are thinking of questions and posting them. I do want to start um, tackling away at some of our uh, frequently asked questions. So first and foremost, will I be required to get this vaccine? Is it going to be mandatory? The answer is no. The decision to become vaccinated is entirely yours and yours alone. Um, neither Maine EMS nor the MDPB recommend any mandatory vaccination policies for COVID-19. We very much want um, through education and through the safety and efficacy information to give you the information to make that decision for yourself. Um, but there should not be any, um, anything that comes across as feeling mandatory or required. One of the things we have noticed though, is that um, collectively you as a community have really exemplified in our state, in your communities and in our nation, the sense of service. And you have been some of the first to stand up at our nation's greatest hours of need. Um, that has been inspiring certainly to the MDPB, but also to your own communities in our state and the nation as a whole. Uh, what we recognize is the decision to become vaccinated affects you and you uh, first and foremost, that you're, this is a very, very personal decision. We also recognize though, with the advent of a vaccination program, we have our first opportunity to take an offensive stance against this vaccine. Um, think of the vaccine like a fire raging across the country right now. By vaccinating, we start to diminish the fuel of that fire to some extent. And at some point with enough individuals vaccinated, we really have the opportunity to quell the transmission of this disease. Um, I think it's fair to say that the MDPB has been inspired by your, uh, your example. And on the next slide, you'll see a number of uh, MDPB members who have, become, uh, who have been vaccinated through their positions as emergency physicians across the country. And we're excited to exemplify um, for you their trust in this vaccine. Um, just taking a quick question. Looks like a question from Facebook. Have there been reports of anaphylactic reactions with the Moderna vaccine? Um, so far, we have not heard of this. They did not report any anaphylactic reactions in the clinical trials. Now, that said, there were not any anaphylactic reactions in the clinical trial of Pfizer either, but we have seen a couple of rare cases that have happened since then, and we're going to talk a little more about some allergies in an upcoming slide. Um, but no, so far, we have not heard about any allergic or anaphylactic reactions to that Moderna vaccine. Great question. All right, our next FAQ is, is it possible that I will contract SARS-CoV-2 from the vaccine? The answer here is no. 
Um, none of the current or planned vaccines, the Moderna or the Pfizer, contain any live virus, so therefore will not infect you with a live virus, um, SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus. The current vaccines only include the instructions, that mRNA material, for your cells to manufacture that spike protein. And the spike, spike protein is that, that coronavirus is key that it uses to enter your cells. So by producing and expressing this protein, your body becomes trained to respond to this protein if it's ever reintroduced to your body. But because of that, you're never exposed to the entire virus or anything that could make you sick um, or, uh, or contagious. Next frequently asked question we have is, is it possible that I will test positive for COVID after vaccination? Um, and the answer here is no. Now the goal of vaccination is for your body to develop an immune response. That immune response will not cause you to test positive when tested using the PCR tests. Remember PCR tests in this case are our gold standard looking for the viral genetic material. Um, and because you're only being given a teeny tiny piece of the viral genetic material, um, it will not trigger positive on the PCR tests. Once your body develops an immune response, there is a possibility that you may test positive on some of the antibody tests, so some of the serum antibody tests that you've seen out there, um, which demonstrate that you've either had a previous exposure to the virus or parts of the virus like the spike protein. So depending on the antibody test, you may test positive for that after being vaccinated. Um, but again, not the PCR test that we use to actually diagnose illness. Next common question we started to get from folks is, um, I already had COVID, should I get vaccinated? We continue to learn a lot more about the coronavirus, but one really interesting feature is it appears to dampen the immune response um, and this prevents some long-term immunity. While there's certainly transient protection after becoming infected, it appears to wane after a matter of months. So particularly in healthcare providers, these are the ones that were tested early on, somewhere between 60 and 90 days after COVID illness, the antibody numbers start to wane. And we use that to say that the immune response is actually waning. In both vaccine studies, there are participants who were seropositive for COVID, meaning that they had antibodies, they've been exposed to the virus before, who were reinfected during the study period. Both vaccines were protective, meaning that the subject who were, were seropositive and in the placebo group had higher rates of reinfection than those subjects in the vaccine group. We say all that to say, yes, even if you have had COVID, you either diagnosed um, based on a PCR test that you tested positive on an antibody test saying at some point your body was exposed to this. Based on that and all of this evidence, the CDC does advise vaccination for individuals who have had the coronavirus, but notes that first of all, they certainly don't want to give you the vaccination while you're still symptomatic. They at least wanna wait that 14 day period. Um, and because we know that there is some presence of antibodies for up to 90 days, um, that it may be reasonable to wait till about that 90 day period, although there certainly is not a need to wait. The one subcategory of folks we know that may need to wait to get the vaccine are going to be anybody who receives the treatment monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies do stick around for that 90 day period, will very much change the way that your immune system responds to the virus. Um, and so if anybody has been treated, and this is rare, we don't have a whole lot of these treatments being used at the moment, but if anybody has been treated with monoclonal antibodies, that will delay vaccination by 90 days. There are a couple of questions we've received over the last couple of town halls from folks asking if they should be tested before they get the vaccine. The answer to that is no, there's no need to be tested before you receive the vaccine. And while it's reasonable to wait up, up until 90 days, it's not, a, it's not a mandate that you wait for up to 90 days. If you have had the, the uh, infection um, 45 days ago and you're offered the vaccine, it is fine to take the vaccine now. The only thing we ask is that if you are actively symptomatic, as Mike said, or you're still within the uh, quarantine, the federal and state quarantine guidelines, those would be times not to present for vaccination. Awesome. Um, this is probably honestly the most frequently asked question that I've fielded so far, um, which is what's gonna happen with masking after vaccination? Um, so some have asked specifically, can we decrease our level of PPE and stop public masking once we're vaccinated? The answer here is no. Even though we will learn later that these vaccines are tremendously effective, they're not 100% effective. So continued PPE and public masking is going to remain essential for our comprehensive safety.
I think about this a little bit further, which is that no single intervention is perfect at preventing spread. Every intervention helps, but each has their vulnerabilities. And so we know that we have implemented a ton of these over the last 10 months, um, but it's only through the layering of these interventions, both personal and shared, that will help us to reduce our personal risk and decrease the spread of the disease. The vaccine itself adds a final layer that we haven't had for the last 10 months, um, but it itself is not perfect and none, neither are any of these other interventions perfect in preventing the spread, but by using all of them and adding additional layers, uh, we hopefully protect ourselves and our community as much as possible. The other way that we've been thinking about this or the metaphor that we've been using is turnout gear in that you wouldn't run into a burning building with just your helmet and, and turnout coat on. Um, and honestly, depending on PPE supplies, we've been at various states of a defensive posture. We've been somewhere between wearing all of our turnout gear or most of our turnout gear for our patient interactions, protecting ourselves as much as possible, but knowing that sometimes we didn't have all of the equipment available to us to, to do that safely. But just like turnout gear, this has entirely been a defensive posture. We've been putting ourselves in a, in a place to try and stay safe in the burning building or amongst the flames, but haven't had anything to combat that. So just like tools, hoses, water, and foam, this vaccine is our first tool to actually fight the virus in an offensive posture. Something that allows us to fight back and actively defend ourselves and our community. All right, next question we've been getting a lot is, can I still infect others um, uh, after, they've been vac after you've been vaccinated? And this is one of the questions that continue to be actively studied. And the answer here is that we don't presently know if vaccinated individuals can transmit the disease as asymptomatic carriers. This is one more reason why our continued PPE, universal masking, and protective postures are going to remain vital for our personal protection, our patient protection, and protection of, the, of uh, our community and those that we love. There were small groups in each of the, um, in each of the studies that actually did active surveillance with uh, swabs of asymptomatic folks. And while they're was uh, some protection, that protection was not at all in any way rigor, uh, rigorous, i.e. in the Moderna group, it was in the 60s and in the Pfizer group, it was in the 50s percent protective. But again, those are small numbers and we need to learn a lot more about that. And the big news about, the, the, um, about both vaccines, as you'll hear, is they decrease, decrease symptomatic infections. We're still, we still have a lot to learn about asymptomatic transmission and asymptomatic infections. Yeah, I'm seeing that same supportive comment from Dr. Schmitz in the chat. Thank you for that. I mean, certainly the, the biology of this makes sense that if we get exposed and our immune system is primed and ready to fight, that it's not going to produce the huge numbers of viral particles that happen with infected people that make them very contagious. But we just don't know that. The clinical trials didn't look at that in a very rigorous fashion. It was not, it's not They were not swabbing every patient in the study every day. Um, so this is something we're going to have to pay close attention to. Um, but hopefully this this extra layer of protection and offensive stance that it puts us in is gonna be really helpful. All right. Um, many have wondered about the vaccine's efficacy on pregnancy and lactation. It's important to know that the available evidence does not completely answer questions about safety in pregnancy. Both trials noted some small numbers of women who became pregnant or were discovered to be pregnant during the vaccine trial, although they weren't specifically sought out as a subgroup for the trial. In these small numbers, the pregnancies have progressed without any apparent adverse reactions. Based on this evidence and the known dangers of pregnant women becoming infected with the coronavirus, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, or ACOG, has recommended that vaccines should not be withheld from pregnant or lactating women. The CDC has further advised women who are pregnant or interested in becoming pregnant in the near future to discuss the risks and benefits of vaccination during pregnancy with your obstetrician. So we know that pregnancy itself is a high risk condition that can lead to severe COVID illness. The one thing we don't have is enough data 
to speak um, intelligently about how vaccines, particularly in pregnancy or lactation, work. But the couple of cases in these trials were certainly very reassuring. And the microbiology and the immunology experts looking at this say it shouldn't affect pregnancy. But again, this is an individual choice and is particularly a conversation that we're going to defer to you and your obstetrician um, before choosing to get the vaccine. As you see, Dr. Shoulders put a whole bunch of links in the chat. These are the things that we've been referencing and have been guiding people to um, when they've been asking about pregnancy in particular as a state um, before vaccination. So lots of resources there. Um, next big question is, can I defer vaccination? Will, will I be able to get the vaccine later? Of course, the decision to vaccination is yours and yours alone. So yes, you can defer the decision of when to get vaccinated is yours as well. That said, you're being prioritized based on your profession right now. It's uncertain what the future supplies of vaccine will look like and if that priority will remain in the future. So we just don't know exactly what's gonna come available. We do know that supplies are very low, that if you choose to defer at the moment that that vaccine is going to go to somebody else um, and that all of our manufacturers are increasing supply as, as fast as they possibly can. We just don't know what our supplies or what our access to these doses is gonna look like in the short or medium term after this initial wave comes through that are, that are delegated for our EMS providers. Um, oh, I'm getting a message that, that Dr. Scholl and I skipped a step here and that we were really excited to roll out a new feature on, uh, on Zoom that we discovered, which is polling. Um, so before we get to our next slide, we're going to talk about safety. Um, uh, we do want to put up one quick poll, which is based on the information you had, preferably before coming into this talk, can you answer the question um, that's popping up on your screen right now? Um, which is before listening to this presentation, were you 100% in, excited to get this vaccine, just waiting to get in line? Were you on the fence looking for more information? That's why you signed up for this or have been reading more articles. Um, or have you already decided that the vaccine at this time is not for you? We'll leave that up there for a minute, see if we had any other questions coming through. We are gonna ask these same questions again at the end to see if we've changed anybody's minds or, or provided the information that you were looking for. While we're pausing for this poll, please send us your questions through the chat function or raise your hand function and unmute yourself. Um, any of those things will work. We'll give this a couple more seconds and get through the minute mark and then we'll uh, close down the poll. If you'd like to participate, uh, you should see the poll on your screen right now. I think it's uh, all you gotta do is click a certain, uh, click next to the statement that most appropriately uh, designates how you feel. All right, we have about 78% of the folks have voted. I'm gonna shut the poll down right now. And this is the, uh, these are the results um, for everyone. So 71% of folks said they were excited to get the vaccine as soon as possible. 27% of folks said they were on the fence and looking for more information. And 2% of folks said, I'm not gonna get the vaccine at this time. We'll take another look at that at the end of the presentation and relaunch that poll as well. Awesome, thanks so much for doing that guys. Um, so next big question, are these vaccines safe? The answer is yes, these vaccines are safe. Um, among the 70 plus thousand subjects who were enrolled in these trials, there were no deaths attributed to the vaccine, no patients requiring hospitalization due to the vaccine, and no cases of the rare neurologic syndromes that we see with some other versions of vaccines. Remember, all prior vaccine experience tells us that adverse reactions occur within the six weeks after vaccination. These trials looked at two months worth of data to ensure that we captured at least that six week period, then some with some additional buffer time. Now that said, once the clinical trials were over and we started some mass vaccination campaigns, um, we have started to see a couple of the rare recurrences of things like allergic reactions. I'm sure everybody has seen um, last week on the, on the first couple of days of Pfizer rollout in Britain, there were two um, UK uh, folks who suffered allergic reactions, fortunately not serious or requiring hospitalization. 
Um, and then within the past week, we had one American here in Alaska um, who had a allergic reaction that did require hospitalization, although um, had a great recovery and was able to go home from the hospital, I think after one night. Between the two major phase three trials, again, there were over 70,000 people that were studied, but now that we're doing mass vaccination, we are at over 1.1 million, we believe, have gotten that Pfizer vaccine so far. We're going to start to see some of these rarer things that didn't pop up in those initial clinical trials. Um, it, the CDC right now has released this information, this little graphic, and again, this QR code will take you to it, um, which is particularly for folks with any history of moderate or severe allergies, what their recommendations are going to be, and you can kind of see where you may fall on this. Um, for the most part, the only absolute contraindication to getting, vac to getting vaccinated is a severe allergic reaction to components of these particular vaccines, the Pfizer or the Moderna. Um, this came directly out of the Pfizer recommendation, which is why it says that there. Um, so if any of the individual components in one of these vaccines, and again, there are not a whole lot of them, but they're all publicly available. If it's something you've had a severe allergic reaction to before, they're gonna say that's the only say, time not to vaccinate. Otherwise, there's either going to be a risk assessment or a period of prolonged observation. Um, so folks who have really high propensity for that, for allergic reactions, carry EpiPens with them everywhere. They're very likely going to undergo a longer period of observation just to make sure that that immediate allergic reaction doesn't happen. And I just posted again the FDA fact sheets for both Pfizer and Moderna, which list the ingredients in both of those for both of the vaccines. Awesome. So again, we believe these vaccines to be safe. Now that said, you will likely have a reaction um, and that this is your immune system working. So again, there's no reported serious outcomes that make us question the safety of these vaccine, but study subjects did have an array of symptoms that they experienced with a strong immune response. Again, what we expect from a vaccine to be able to do is elicit a strong immune response. And so there were certainly some subjects um, that had some. We did notice in both of the, uh, the data sets from Moderna and Pfizer that it seemed to be more often after the second dose of the vaccine, but recorded to recur in the first day or two after receiving the vaccine, and then usually resolve within one to two days after. I'll show you a little bit of data on what that looks like. So this is the, the best graphical representation Moderna had for us, and this is out of their phase one trial. Um, but this is percentages of people um, that got any version of a symptom and you can see any systemic symptoms and what exactly those symptoms were or any local systems with those being pain, redness or swelling um, after the first vaccination or after the second vaccination. Now you will see most of these bars in the bar graphs are gray, which are reported to be mild symptoms. There are certainly some blue or moderate symptoms with very, very rare, severe symptoms. And in these cases, primarily being local and some folks reporting some severe pain um, at those locations, uh, or sorry, severe, uh, some severe redness um, at a couple of those locations. Data from the Moderna phase three um, information reveals some very, very similar um, data, just wasn't quite as pretty as this graph was. So I felt that this was a little, little better representation of what we were looking at. To show the, uh, the Pfizer data, just because this is very similar. Um, and if anybody is working in a healthcare setting where the Pfizer is becoming available, we know Moderna is our preferred um, option for our EMS um, providers um, based on availability as well as some of the cold storage stuff. But if anybody is getting access to the Pfizer, we wanted to show that. So again, kind of similar numbers of wide ranges of folks um, complaining of some symptoms. Most of them worse with the second dose. Interestingly, they actually broke out some age categories with the Pfizer data saying that the vast majority of people who experienced worse uh, uh, versions of these symptoms were in the younger category, so less than 55, so milder symptoms for those that are over uh, 55. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we put all this up here so people could see this and recognize what, uh, what exactly we're talking about, about what these immune system reactions or responses look like. Awesome, I'm seeing a question from Facebook Live. You have a link to the paper for the phase three tr trials for Moderna and vaccine. Great, awesome. Um, so it uh, looks like Sam put a link there as well. And for those of you that are watching the, um, the Zoom link, this QR code will take you specifically to that information for the Pfizer phase three. This will take you specifically to this paper, which is the Moderna phase one. So you can find exactly where these graphics came from. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we talked about vaccine safety. Next big thing we want to get into here is vaccine efficacy. Does the vaccine work? Is it effective? And the answer here, honestly, is a resounding yes, and more so than, than any of us expected our preliminary vaccines to come out looking. Um, so we know that vaccination reduces the rate of contracting COVID. This is kind of some combined data from the two vaccines and the two phase three trials, where between both of those huge trials of 70,000 total participants, 347 people, subjects in that trial, ended up contracting COVID in the placebo group, while only 19 patients contracted COVID in the vaccination group. And then in even more than that, if you did get uh, COVID, it reduced the rate of contracting severe COVID with 39 patients in the placebo group uh, contracting severe COVID and one person in the vaccinated group contracting severe COVID. And actually this was really helpful to know from the, uh, the study participants because of their definition of severe COVID, they said anybody with an oxygen, oxygen saturation of 93% or less qualified as severe COVID, regardless of whether they actually received oxygen treatment or hospitalization. And this one case that was reported here was exactly that. It was somebody who had an oxygen saturation of 93%, so that qualified him as severe, although he was never, uh, never hospitalized and never required any oxygen treatment. So really reassuring that if you are going to contract COVID, the likelihood of getting severe COVID is much, much less. Um, and uh, the likelihood of getting COVID period is much less, much, much less after vaccination. These are the numbers that are used to represent those 94 and 95% efficacies you've been hearing about in the news. One other thing I just like to point out with this data, um, these numbers held across age groups, gender groups, a bunch of different demographics. In particular, um, both phase three trials sought people um, that were elderly, people with multiple comorbidities, knowing that that was um, who this virus um, was affecting most severely. Um, so in, in all age groups and a bunch with these different subgroup comorbidities, this efficacy holds. These are the graphs to tell us how many subjects in the trials contracted COVID over time. Each vaccine trial collected the data a little bit differently and presented a little bit differently. Um, but in both graphs, the blue line that trends upward the entire time is the placebo group, those contracting COVID um, as the cases go on with uh, time on the x-axis and number of cases on the y-axis here. And then the red line is the vaccine group that shows that once immunized, the group contracts COVID at a remarkably lower rate. You'll see a couple little graphics I've added at the bottom here just to show when the vaccinations actually occurred. So the Pfizer one at day zero and 21 and the Moderna one happening at zero and day 28. Again, they, they collected data a little bit differently here and they didn't collect or report the data in these early couple of days. Um, but we do see shortly after vaccination, once that um, immune response has kicked in, people in the placebo group continue to get COVID at a relatively steady rate in each one of these trials. Um, but people who are vaccinated plateau off and get very rare cases of COVID, very few um, upticks in that line uh, over time. Awesome. So we presented a lot of information. Um, we've talked about the microbiology. Um, we've talked about the process of Operation Warp Speed, how vaccines have been developed over the last uh, 10 months, um, and then in particular about the safety and efficacy of these two vaccines that have just passed their emergency use authorization are being um, uh, made available to healthcare givers right now. So we want to know what other questions you have. Again, we can do this through the chat function, through some raise your hand uh, function, um, or if we uh, uh, are not responding to those quick enough, if you just wanna unmute yourself and ask a question out loud, we're happy to do that too. Yeah, we're excited to hear from you. So please, uh, start uh, any questions you have, hit, them, hit us up through any of those three mechanisms, please. There's 55 of you out there. I'm sure we didn't answer all of your questions so far. Hi, Docs. Bob Arnold from Sanford here. Hi, Bob. Awesome. Hey. My, good, I'm coming through. Um, my questions mostly are going to be more so in the administration, not so much the effectiveness or the, the, the how the vaccine works. And I'm not sure if this is the environment for those questions. Is, is the question about kind of like logistics and rollout? Yeah, kind of. 
in, in that you're, you're welcome to shoot oh. it at us. Matt and I may not be the experts okay. on it, but we do have some right. EMS staff on here who might be able to answer it for us. Perfect. So if I get uh, X number of vials, which is X number of doses, should I plan on administering every single one of them to 1A people and 1B when that opens up? Or do I need to count two doses per person and hope that it all gets done within the 30 day shelf life? Bob, I can actually answer that for you. And that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So the question, if I can restate it for anyone is, do I need to, if I get 500 doses of vaccine, can I only uh, vaccinate 250 people knowing they need two vaccines? And the answer to that is no. You can vaccinate 500 people with the 500 doses you get immediately because the federal government is actually in all cases withholding the second dose of vaccine until it's time for the second dose of vaccine. So you can actually provide the entire supply of doses to the to people who need their first dose of vaccine and you will receive at the 28 day mark for the Moderna vaccine, uh, the next set of uh, doses for uh, the next series for everyone's dose two of vaccine. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Excellent, thank you. And I have a second one. Um, Please, yes. And I've been trying to, we're formulating the SOPs and how to, how to roll it out and do, do our vaccinations for other agencies. And one of the questions that I, we've come up with and I don't have an answer yet is the open vials at the end of the day, if there is such a thing. And I, zero waste, that's my goal, zero waste. But should, is the trying to come up with a plan of only open a vial if we have a, a group of five people to accept it or the end of the day, we have a vial with three doses left. Um, is there going to be an official word anywhere that says those three doses can go to a 1B candidate or somebody? Um, I, I'm only going to assume there's going to be high scrutiny, and I don't want to be the one who gets called out as someone who's giving it to my friends. Keith Harmon, yeah. if that makes sense. Yep. This is Sam Hurley, Director of Mania Mass. Um, we can answer that question online, but the short and sweet of it is um, we are not throwing any vaccine away. Um, so that's the short and sweet of it, but uh, we have developed a policy of how those uh, doses will be handled and what we will do with those. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Sam. Steve Ballantyne asks the question, when will we know about the rolled out schedule? Uh, I think, uh, C. Ballantyne, you're referencing, when, when will we know when a uh, vaccine will be coming to us as individuals or us as a service? And if that's the case, the answer is that uh, Maine EMS has been working with services that have volunteered to be vaccine distributors in every county. Those services are working diligently on communicating with all the other agencies that are acting as vaccine distributors and with all the other agencies within that county in an effort to do that scheduling right now. The vaccine plan, which I'll put back in the chat function for folks who wanna take a look at it, starts to uh, describe some of this information. Um, and if you have more specific questions about your service, you can reach out to Maine EMS uh, and we can help you understand when that vaccine will be coming to your service with a little bit more granularity. Um, Ray Green asks, will there be an annual booster for the vaccine similar to the flu shot? Mike, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, so the short answer is we don't know. Um, we suspect that the answer is no based on exactly what the vaccine is targeting and that it's targeting this one spike protein um, rather than a number of the proteins that the influenza uh, virus tar targets. And we know that those ones um, the H proteins and the N proteins change very frequently, which is why we end up changing the flu vaccine so often. Not that it's necessarily that your immune system is no longer immune. It just is being presented with a new variant every year, every couple of years. But we're going to be able to answer that more definitively as time goes on. And those uh, patients in the phase three trials are continued to watch to see how long that immunity lasts. Because um, this is a really good question. We get asked this a lot. Is it going to be like a tetanus vaccine um, or, uh, or something similar that has some period of, of uh, length where it, it becomes less effective and we end up needing boosters and re-ups. And unfortunately, we just don't know yet. Absolutely. One of the questions we heard today in the earlier town hall meeting, and Mike, maybe um, between you and me, we can tackle this 
one. There've been a lot of media on a potential new strain of COVID-19 in the UK. And there've been some folks who wondered if this vaccine will still be effective in that uh, context of a potential new strain. Do you wanna tackle that question too, Mike? Yeah, I'm happy to, and then jump in. I mean, so the the short answer is we hope so. Um, the information here is very, very early. The state of the science that we have um, right now is uh, moving at an unbelievable pace in that they are able to constantly sequence the genome of this virus over and over and over again. And that's been happening since January when we got the first complete sequence, um, but they've been running this co essentially constantly since then. We've seen mutations happen to the virus throughout, um, and that's a known thing. We know that viruses and their genetic code mutates relatively quickly, um, and that is expected. The ones from this morning or the last 48 hours where we've heard out of uh, the UK that are more concerning are that they're talking about increased rates of um, infectivity, meaning more folks are getting sick with it, although they're not appearing to get sicker with it. Um, and that certainly raises an important question to us. We do know that they have reported some genetic mutations or deletions in that sequence that causes the spike protein to form. That sequence is something like 1,200 genetic pieces long, and they've seen somewhere between seven and 10 mutations or deletions happen within that. Um, so it is a change in the spike protein, which we're certainly paying attention to. Now, the reassuring part to us is that that spike protein is integral to the way that the coronavirus actually enters our cells. So if that spike protein changes too much, it's not going to be able to enter our cells. That's the key that works in that ACE2 receptor lock to get into our cells. So if that continues to mutate too much, we think that it's going to be a far less effective virus at entering the cells. Um, whether or not that's going to change the, the overall function of the um, vaccine so far, we just we don't know, but we sure hope not. Thanks for that, Mike. There's a question that Sam posted about how much immunity or reduction severe illness does the first dose grant? Do you want to back up one slide and demonstrate that yeah. to everyone? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, and honestly, I can only answer this for the Pfizer vaccine because they're the ones who gave us this data um, uh, most succinctly. Um, but again, first dose of this vaccine uh, administered here on day zero. About 12 days in is where we see the divergence between the placebo and the vaccine groups with the vaccinated uh, folks getting fewer cases of COVID compared to those uh, folks in the placebo group. And that continues to plateau off more over time. So we do think there is certainly some protection from a single vaccine. Now that said, we're not recommending that anybody only get one single dose. Both manufacturers have designed this around this prime and boost um, uh, theory of getting your immune system ready and then um, getting your immune system trained for that long lasting uh, version and the fast acting version of immunogenicity. Um, but there does, does certainly seem to be some version of protection happening very early on after uh, less than two weeks of the first dose. But as Mike mentioned, what we know about the, the, the entire protection, that 95%, that 94% is, is um, received only after the prime and boost or the first and second dose. And in all cases, the recommendations are for both doses of the, of the, of the vaccine to achieve that best level of protection. Uh, I got another private question, sorry. Um, uh, I got a private question here about um, someone having had a cancer history and a subsequent stem, stem cell transplant. Um, this is going to be a case where, and I'm going to say this for any particular um, health illnesses that anybody on the call has or particular medications that you may be on that you're concerned about, this is going to have to be a reach out to your doc and ask that very specific question because honestly, I don't know. We certainly think that um, this vaccine is going to be uh, safe and effective for most people, but that Risk benefit is going to change a little bit depending on uh, your personal history and the personal medications that you're you're taking. So great question. I wish I had a a more definitive answer, um, but I think reaching out to your own doc is going to be the best way for you to uh, to get a good answer on that. Yeah, Mike, I think that's perfect advice. If you've got a specific condition uh, or you have a loved one with a specific condition, you have questions about that. The best uh, the best guidance would be to reach to your or your loved one's caregiver who's managing that illness. They'll be the best equipped to tell you about uh, nuances regarding your illness, the vaccine, the medications you're on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've 
heard similar questions across the other town halls about various immunocompromised states or immuno, immune modulating drugs or autoimmune diseases, cancers, et cetera. And in all those instances, it will be really helpful for you to gain the counsel of the folks who are, um, who are managing those illnesses for you because they know best your specific circumstances. Um, Chief O'Brien asked about children, and at this point in time, these vaccines are not necessarily recommended for children. Pfizer is approved for 16 and older. Moderna is approved for 18 and older. We're learning more about children. The, both of the trials have enrolled down to the age of 12, but we don't have that information yet, and they weren't included in the emergency use authorization, authorization at this time. Uh, I did get a message. Dr. Michael Schmidt uh, would like to uh, make a little uh, plug for everyone. If you don't, uh, Mike, do you mind unmuting yourself and going ahead and speaking up? Oh, sure thing, Matt. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you uh, very much for the excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to point something out uh, that you guys alluded to and that is being observed nationally, and that is people who are part of this phase 1A uh, vaccine administration are literally becoming ambassadors in their community. Um, they're putting uh, information or, or uh, photos up on Facebook, not just showing that they're getting vaccinated, but demonstrating their support for the process. Um, and I think what they're, what they're doing and what they're showing is how they, how we all move ourselves from that those questions that we all have about whether or not a vaccine is safe into what that uh, main front line, warm line uh, diagram points out as, as the learning zone. Um, so your job is as EMS providers, you know, once you decide to, if you decide to get the vaccine, it's also to share that process and how you came to that conclusion with other people openly and honestly, similar to what you heard and, and received today. It'll help us make a big impact in our communities. And again, thank you for this excellent presentation. Thanks for that, Thanks. Mike. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, as, as you guys all know, um, we all get reached out to by our friends, our family, anybody that that reaches to us for specific medical questions and sees us as the resource. Uh, we know that that is exactly what your friends and family are doing with you. So certainly um, sharing them any of this information, we will make all of this available, but also your thoughts, your impressions behind this, your decision um, is gonna be huge. We certainly wanna make sure that, that people are getting this information and making these decisions uh, for themselves. Are there any other questions folks have? Please uh, feel free to use the chat function, the raise your hand function, or just unmute yourself uh, if we don't get to you soon enough. Any, any other questions that any of you have? Maybe while um, you're thinking of your questions, why don't we do that poll again here? I'm gonna pull that up real quickly. Um, this is your feeling after listening to the presentation. I'll leave this up for about two minutes while you're thinking about other questions. Anyone else who, um, who wants to ask anything, please do so through any of the uh, before described methods. Any questions for uh, for us at all? <clears throat> if you'd like to answer the poll, please do so. We'll leave it up for about another 10, 10 seconds or so. So just to remind everyone earlier on about 41 people responded, 71% said that they were excited to get the vaccine as soon as possible. 27% said they were on the fence and looking for more information and 2% said they weren't going to get the vaccine at this time. Um, I'm gonna end this poll right now with 35 people responding. And in this instance, it looks like 94% said they were excited to get the vaccine. 3% uh, said they're still on the fence and 3% still said they're still confident there and they think 
still not confident and think they're going to wait. That's These are the shared results for everyone who's interested. And while you're looking like at that, certain people or... Uh... <laughs> Sorry, Matt, go ahead. Or some folks left, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, exactly. We're scared of uh, anybody that was on the fence. <laughs> Um, but if there are questions, please um, please uh, send them to us. I see Mark just put something in a variety of resources, um, including vaccine resources, um, and then the same uh, general reference and talking points uh, document is in there as well. Thanks for putting that in there, Mark. Uh, thanks for your comment. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. Uh, folks sticking around and listening to this with us. Um, you know, the reality is we owe you guys all a debt of gratitude for all of the hard work that you've been doing over the last 10 months. We know that this has been an impossible task that none of us thought we were signing up for. Um, it's been long, it's been difficult, and by no means is this the end of the pandemic. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, we do think this is the, the earliest sign of hope or the earliest light at the end of the tunnel that we've seen. Uh, we certainly hope that this presentation and discussion have helped to answer some of the questions that you may have had about the vaccine, the vaccine science, um, and the process. We continue to be inspired by you and the work that you guys do every day. I am gonna put up one more slide here, which is just some additional resources. I know a lot of it has been sent out um, on the uh, chat function here, but that main EMS uh, coronavirus page and the QR link that will take you to it. Um, this New England Journal um, of Medicine link, which is amazing New England Journal. It usually charges us all an arm and a leg to participate has made all of their coronavirus articles and opinion articles and editorials and everything free. So there is a ton of access to the primary literature there. Um, the phase one, two, and three trials as they come out are all being posted there. Um, and then the uh, CDC fact sheet about these vaccines. Bob Arnold posted the MEMSED link to the vaccine training. Many thanks go to Sam Hurley, Chris Azevedo, and the rest of the Mania MS staff for working so diligently on those. Um, those are a requirement for all the vaccine distribution service uh, individuals who are going to be uh, actively vaccinating our um, EMS clinicians and public safety uh, providers, including police, fire, and EMD uh, members, uh, but has a tremendous amount of information for anyone that is intended to be a resource. If you would like, please follow that link to... Um, MEMS Ed and the, those vaccine re uh, references. If you want more information, that's another source for more uh, information about the vaccine. Tony ran this with the uh, the Region Three Medical Director. It ran for two and a half hours, which either speaks really well about the uh, the Region Three Medical Director or the people that were on that call. But please, if things come up that have not been answered here, reach out to us directly. Um, we are happy to answer them. Uh, we certainly have some time here. If anybody's got some more questions that they want to ask that we haven't tackled, we'd love to do that. And if you'd like to reach out to us after the fact, you can go to the main EMS website, go on the top rocker there where it says boards and committees. The MDPB is one of the first two that will drop down. If you click on the MDPB link, it will uh, get you to our email addresses. Please feel free to ask any of the MDPB members, um, including your regional medical director or myself and Dr. Zimmerman, the state EMS medical director and the associate state EMS director. We are always happy to help you and support your questions and if we don't have the right answer, we'll seek it or find someone who does, or at least find a way to answer your question with the best evidence we can. Any other questions folks have, please let us know. We're excited. Matt? Yes, Sam. Uh, one thing to note, uh, I would like to just say thank you for everyone who joined today's town hall and who have joined other town halls uh, that we have offered. We really do appreciate your attention 
um, and appreciate your willingness to spend some time with us as we review these materials uh, so people can make informed and educated decisions about whether or not they would like to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. That said, please note that this uh, training will be made available uh, on the Main EMS YouTube channel. You can find a link to our YouTube channel at the bottom of our webpage, main.gov forward slash EMS. You can find our YouTube channel there. Um, as soon as this is transcribed, because we're a government entity, we have to have it transcribed before we put it on YouTube. So uh, once it's transcribed, we will be uploading it. It usually takes a couple of hours. Uh, so may not be may not be this evening, it may be first thing tomorrow, but it will be uploaded. Um, additionally, we have created the course, which I know links have been placed in the, in the chat. The online course essentially synthesizes some of this material as well, uh, but it also has administration material um, for those who are administering the vaccine. Completion of the course is not required. Again, not required for people who just want to receive the vaccine. However, it is required for anyone who is administering the vaccine. Uh, so just, just make sure you keep in that, mind, I, that in mind. I don't want people to feel as though they have to take the training to get the vaccine. The last thing I would like to add is please take care of yourself. It is extremely important that you continue taking care of yourself. These times continue to be tumultuous and continue to put a lot of stress on us. Um, over and above the added stress of the holiday season, which we know we run into every um, every time this year, uh, every time this time of year. Uh, so please take care of yourself. There are resources on our website, main.gov forward slash EMS, the Stay Healthy and EMS link. They talk about local, regional, statewide, and national resources to help uh, during these stressful times. It is so important that you take a moment um, and take care of yourself. Um, and so please do not hesitate to reach out to the main frontline warm line. That resource is there for you um, to help uh, give you support and resources during this time. So if you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to your agency medical director, your regional medical director, the MDPB members, the main EMS office, um, if you have any questions and we will be more than happy to assist you to the best of our ability or if we can't we will find someone who can uh, so thank you so much for joining us and uh, i hope everyone has a good afternoon and a happy holiday yeah thank you all for coming today i echo sam's happy holidays and please if there are any questions that come up please don't hesitate to reach out to us thank you all very very much